dear colleagues, welcome to today's working group on cardiovascular regenerative and reparative medicine webinar. The title of this webinar is New Concept in Cardiac Regeneration Part 2, Translation and Insight. This webinar is part two of the program of the working group webinars. I am Associate Professor Giulio Pompilio from Certo Centro Cardiologico Monzino, Milano, Italy. And I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Serena Zacchigna from International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, Trieste, Italy, and Professor Eduardo Marban from Cedar Sinai Medical Center, Los Angeles, California. The aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding through clinical cases presentation of cardiomocyte proliferation as a target or re of regenerative therapies and the exploitation of extracellular vesicles as future therapeutics. The session is interactive and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. For the best learning experience, we also invite you to participate in online assessment sessions in the form of multiple choice questions that will be submitted during the presentations. I will now hand over to Dr. Zacchinia for the presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Pompilio. I believe that in this audience, I don't need to introduce uh, the uh, clinical uh, relevance of cardiac diseases. And so I would go uh, straight forward to the central topic of this seminar, which is the holy grail of uh, cardiac regeneration. It is uh, a matter of fact that most of uh, cardiac pathologies resulting in a depressed cardiac function are associated with a massive loss of cardiomyocytes, for instance, uh, after myocardial infarction, up to 4 billion cardiomyocytes are lost. And this, of course, results in a contractile dysfunction that eventually leads to heart failure. And this happens because the adult mammalian heart is not uh, able to regenerate itself after damage. So during embryonic development in the intrauterine life, cardiomyocytes actively proliferate and divide in order to build the heart mass. And then something happens at birth which makes them quiescent. They terminally differentiate completely change their structure and become these uh, nice uh, rod-shaped cells, which are often multinucleated and have a very complex uh, sarcomeric uh, contractile apparatus that is probably a physical constraint to cell division. And we will come back to this point at the end of uh, my presentation. So when does this uh, transition occur? And this leads me to introduce uh, uh, this uh, clinical case that I have chosen for today's webinar. And this has been actually published in Circulation Research by the group, uh, the, by the group of uh, Joseph Penninger in 2016. And it is the case of uh, a boy who was uh, born at term with a physiological uh, labor as uh, shown by normal uh, values of the umbilical cord arterial blood. However, the newborn manifested severe cyanosis and uh, oxygen saturation was uh, markedly decreased. So despite ventilation therapy, it did not improve and thus it was referred to a pediatric center for cardiac examination. And the ECG here revealed the clear signs of acute myocardial ischemia. Echocardiography showed severely impaired left ventricular function with abnormal uh, regional wall contractions. And also the cardiac biomarkers such as troponin T and creatine kinase, which are both clinical markers of uh, cardiac damage, were massively increased within hours. So, all these parameters uh, clearly indicated that the, new, the newborn child uh, has a severe cardiac injury. And to determine the cause of the myocardial damage, a cardiac angiography was eventually performed, showing a complete thrombotic occlusion of the proximal LAD, 
without any detectable collateral blood flow. So intravenous thrombolysis was initiated about uh, 28 hours after the first symptoms and repeated angiography showed reopening of the occluded LED lesion at the three days. So despite the reestablishment of coronary blood flow, the child continued to present with myocardial damage as evidenced by anteroceptal edema, regional hypokinesis uh, at the area where he had the myocardial infarction and uh, pathological Q waves at the ECG. So that's the final diagnosis uh, uh, for the newborn was uh, a severe LAD occlusion for more than 20, 20 hours, resulting in a massive myocardial infarction. So now the uh, multiple choice question for you, the first one is what was the outcome of the very young patient? He completely recovered at 45 days or he showed persisting signs of cardiac dysfunction at follow-up. He developed heart failure when he was one year old or he died at two months. So I guess now we have 30 seconds for uh, all participants to answer. Dr. Zakinia, one yeah. question for you. Uh, it seems that in this regard, uh, human babies uh, are similar to mice. Exactly. In the capacity of the regeneration of the heart uh, in the first days after birth. Is it correct? Exactly. So you anticipated the correct answer. I don't know whether you already have the response. Uh... I have the response, uh, and uh, we have a 26% 20, uh, that uh, has have chosen the complete recovery at uh, 45 days. 46% persistent signs of cardiac dysfunction at repeated follow-up, 24% heart failure at one year, and only 5% deaths at two months. So, so there, there was no one clear uh, and uh, highly voted answer, but the correct answer is the first one. As uh, during the subacute phase, uh, it continuously improved all serum markers rapidly return to normal levels, as happened for all parameters of cardiac function. And at the one-year follow-up, he had a completely normal heart, with no signs of any structural or functional abnormality. So the correct answer was complete recovery, which was already evident at 45 days. And after this publication, we also contacted our clinical colleagues, uh, the, our pediatric center, and they also confirmed the occurrence uh, of a few cases of myocardial infarction in neonates without any structural heart disease at the follow-up. And this is, as you pointed out, exactly the reason I decided to present this clinical case, because it indicates that what we have learned about cardiac regeneration in fishes, amphibians, and neonatal mice may be actually translated to humans, and that similar to mice, the human heart also preserves a time window shortly after birth, during which it can possibly efficiently regenerate. But so what happens at birth that permanently drive cardiomyocytes out of the cell cycle and block the regenerative capacity of the heart? So our lab has investigated uh, several possible answers and uh, explore the role of various changes that the heart suddenly experiences after birth and that might be responsible for blunting the regenerative response of the heart. So a first change is a sudden increase in oxygen tension. During intrauterine life, there is a significant mixing of arterial and venous blood resulting in a relatively hypoxic environment while soon after birth, the, the transition from embryonic to postnatal circulation drastically increases the oxygenation state of cardiomyocytes. And this results in an increased ROS production and cardiomyocyte cell cycle arrest through a activation of the DNA damage response. And consistently scavenging of ROS delays the postnatal cell cycle arrest, 
thus implying oxygen-induced activation of the DNA damage response pathway as an important mediator of cardiomyocyte quiescence in the postnatal life. Another major change occurring at birth is the sudden lack of exposure to the maternal circulation, which represents a possible source of factors promoting cardiomyocyte proliferation. So among the major modification in the maternal blood is the expansion of uh, a subpopulation of uh, T lymphocytes called regulatory T cells or T-rex, which are expanded in the, um, in the blood of the mother to induce tolerance uh, of the mother toward the paternal antigens that are present on fetal cells. So of interest, in addition to their immunological function, tear hags have been recently identified as key players in tissue homeostasis and regenerative processes, including mass regeneration and the metabolism of the adipose tissue, mainly through the secretion of cytokines and growth factors, and thus, we decided to investigate whether T-Rex that are abundant in the maternal circulation may also act in a paracrine manner to induce the proliferation of cardiomyocytes. And in this recent work, we show that they indeed support cardiomyocyte proliferation in the developing fetal heart, but they also have an effect on the mother heart. And this implies that in addition to the pathological, the physiological hypertrophy commonly associated to any pregnancy, there might be a role also for some hyperplasia and that T-Rex promote cardiomyocyte proliferation also in the mother's heart. So overall, uh, these data indicate that there might be some regenerative potential endowed in mammalia cardiomyocytes but that this is clearly suppressed and not efficient to repair cardiac damage in adult individuals. So independent from the mechanism that block the endogenous regeneration in the mammalian heart, can we envisage a strategy to boost cardiomyocyte proliferation? And so seven years ago, we decided to go for an unbiased screening and in the wake of the emerging role of microRNAs as master regulators of multiple biological processes, we wanted to screen for microRNAs controlling cardiomyocyte proliferation, exploiting these uh, high throughput screening facilities and libraries available at the ICGP in Trieste. And we decided to use primary uh, rat cardiomyocytes, which were seeded in multiple plates and transfected with each of the human microRNAs that were annotated at that time. There were about uh, 1,000 um, mature sequences. And then we administer EDU to label all proliferating cells and stain the cells for automated immunofluorescence imaging and analysis by high content microscopy. And this is uh, how the cells look like. Cardiomyocytes here are staying in green using alpha anti-alpha actinine antibodies. Uh, nuclei that have uh, incorporated EDU, meaning that they have uh, replicated their DNA, are staying uh, in red. And all nuclei are labeled in blue uh, by X. And I mentioned that uh, these are uh, uh, primary cells, so it is normal to have uh, some contaminating non-cardiomyocyte cells, uh, probably fibroblasts here and there. And this down here is the same image elaborated by the high content microscope in which the red nuclei belonging to green cardiomyocytes are shown in yellow. And the software also automatically count the percentage of cardiomyocyte nuclei that are EDU positive and this, in normal conditions, is about 12%. And as you can see, in the case of this microRNA, 593P, this percentage is raised up to almost 50%. You see here, full of yellow nuclei. And so, to make a long story short, we could identify about 40 
human microRNAs. Sorry, something. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Yeah, about 40 human microRNAs uh, um, that are able to promote the proliferation of both uh, mouse and rat cardiomyocytes. Using multiple markers of cell progression, you see here KI67, but we use more, and you also use markers of cytokinases, such as localization of Aurora B at mid-bodies. And eventually, we use the two of these microRNAs, 199A and 590, um, uh, to boost uh, cardiomyocyte proliferation and uh, promote cardiac regeneration in a mouse model of uh, myocardial infarction, as can be obtained by the permanent ligation of the LAD. And in this case, uh, we had to clone the uh, microRNA precursors and vectors derived from the adeno-associated virus and inject them directly into the heart in the border region of the infarct. And as you can see, both microRNAs importantly preserved cardiac function and resulted, as you can see here compared to the upper sections, resulted in a smaller scar and most importantly induced cardiomyocyte proliferation in adult hearts. So in the process of uh, moving this uh, strategy forward to the clinics, in collaboration with the group of Fabio Recchia in Pisa, we tested the microRNA 199, also in a model of uh, ischemia reperfusion in pigs, as can be achieved by occluding the LID after its uh, first uh, diagonal branch for 90 minutes, and then restoring the perfusion again. To better mimic a clinical scenario in which uh, a patient experiencing a myocardial infarction might receive the microRNA treatment at the time of surgical reperfusion through angioplasty, for instance. And here I'm showing some cardiac MRI, which are quite self-explanatory and do not require special skills to be understood. This is a control myocardial infarction. This uh, white signal here is the blood, and this gray circle is the myocardium of the left ventricle, a very thin and poorly mobile anterior wall here and the septum. While this is one animal treated with a vector expressing microRNA 199, as you can see, there is a much more contractile tissue all around anterior wall and septum, and clearly the function is better. And this is another 3D animal, again, much more contractile and pumping tissue. So we were very happy and excited about these results, and we were looking for the long-term effect of this uh, therapy. When at about uh, two months, almost all the treated animals suddenly died, while the controls were, of course, with a depressed cardiac function, but still alive. So my second question is, what do you think was the cause of death in this animal? A myocarditis, a cancer, an arrhythmia, or an hemorrhagic shock? And I inserted this question because when we submitted the paper the first time, actually, this was something that all the reviewers asked. So this is uh, something that I provocatively ask uh, all the audience. Dr. Zakinia. Yeah. So apparently one can say it's arrhythmia because it's sudden death uh, in uh, treated uh, animals. Yes. Uh, indeed, uh, that was the most uh, plausible answer also for us, but this is not the only answer. So let's see whether okay. you can announce so, the results. Yeah. So we have the results. Yes. And uh, the 30% think that the sudden death is caused by myocarditis, 12% cancer, 58% arrhythmia, and only 2%, 3% hemorrhagic shock. Yes, exactly. So it seems so. that the majority of the audience think about the, an arrhythmic cause. 
Yes, and we also had this in mind, and this is uh, why also to uh, respond to the reviewer's request, we had to repeat all the in vivo experiment in pigs by implanted a reveal. And indeed, we were able to detect a few episodes of uh, tachyarrhythmias that uh, then evolved into ventricular fibrillation that was clearly the final cause of that in these animals. But at the histological analysis, we also found something that is probably the anatomical substrate of the arrhythmias that we could record. And it's something that is similar to cancer. This is why I anticipated that maybe the answers, uh, the correct answers were more than one. Because what we found uh, um, is uh, these uh, uh, kind of uh, cell clusters that uh, are not inflammatory cells. They are all negative for the pan leukocytic marker CD45. They are highly proliferating cells. They are all positive for KI67. And they express uh, these markers of uh, high, uh, early myogenic differentiation, such as GATA4 and uh, myogenin, suggesting that they are a sort of uh, highly proliferating cardiomyocyte progenitor cells. So what we believe has happened here is that the microRNA has uh, stimulated the partial de-differentiation of cardiomyocytes, which is uh, probably a requisite to allow their proliferation. If you remember one of the first slides in which we said that the complex sarcomeric apparatus of the adult cardiomyocytes uh, need to be disassembled because it inhibits and it's a physical impediment for cell division, so that it, it needs to be disassembled to allow the cell to divide. And indeed, there are multiple evidence accumulating in the literature linking cardiomyocyte proliferation with at least a partial disassembly of a sarcomeric and cytoskeletal structure of these cardiomyocytes. So these dedifferentiated cells probably started to proliferate too much and forming this uh, tumor-like structure. And this likely happened as a consequence of the too prolonged expression of the microRNA as it was achieved using AAV vectors because these vectors uh, keep expressing the transgene uh, virtually forever. So is there a way to have uh, these microRNAs express and acting for a time sufficient to induce a wave or regeneration, but not for too long, to avoid the long-term consequences and overproliferation. And so we went back to the mouse model and tried to administer the same uh, microRNAs as uh, synthetic RNA molecules, the same mimics that everybody used to transfect cells in culture. And surprisingly, and uh, we didn't expect this, when we injected this uh, synthetic uh, microRNA into the heart, directly into the cardiac muscle, we could see that they can persist for about two weeks. And this is probably enough to reproduce the therapeutic benefit in terms of uh, reduced scar size and also cardiomyocyte proliferation and thus cardiac regeneration. So we still need to prove that we can adopt this strategy to deliver synthetic microRNA also in a large animal models and possibly humans, but we are doing it. And thus my answer to the initial question, which was launched as a title for my presentation is yes. I definitely believe that cardiomyocyte proliferation is a real target for regenerative therapies. And with this, I think I can conclude um, my presentation and I still have to thank all the people at the ICGP and the University of Trieste who contributed to this work from, sorry, from my group uh, at the Cardiovascular Biology Lab, as well as from the Molecular Medicine Lab, which is headed by Mauro Giacca, with whom I have shared all the work I showed you with you today. Dr. Zakinia, thank you very much for this elegant presentation. Can we share some of the many questions coming from the audience with you? Sure. So one question is about uh, markers of cardiomyocyte proliferation. And uh, it's about the best marker. 
you think has to be used to track this? Problem? Yes, of course, uh, everybody knows that in the heart we have uh, this uh, dual way of uh, looking at uh, nuclear cell division, which often results in polyploidization and uh, real uh, cardiomyocyte division in terms of uh, cytokinesis, so division of the cytoplasm which uh, can be assessed uh, not easily and the markers that uh, is the most reliable so far is visualizing aurora b uh, at mid body so at the site where the two cytoplasma are taken apart and this of course is very tricky to visualize so uh, there are a few labs that are developing um, genetic systems to track uh, cell division also through multiple generations so there will probably I don't know how much I can say because this is not published uh, yet but uh, of course uh, there are uh, uh, works presented at congresses where uh, for instance using um, promoters that are uh, actively um, that are active during cell cycle division we can track um, cardiomyocytes that have repeatedly entered cell cycle and so that have proliferated even more than once. Thank you. Another question is about uh, cardiomyocyte proliferation in neonates. Are you aware of uh, causes uh, beyond the ischemic ones? If the theology is different, have we evidence about uh, same process occurs in mice or in humans. Yeah, so um, of course we don't have any proof because uh, what we can uh, guess in humans is just uh, indirect uh, evidence that we don't have uh, permanent uh, lesions. But even uh, myocarditis in, uh, in, in children often uh, heal with no structural consequences. So that's the only direct experience that we had in our center here. But I would guess that any damage um, could be repaired efficiently in, uh, in, in neonates. Thank you. Uh, another question is about uh, your caramel sites in pigs. Yeah. Have you performed the cell sorting in these caramel sites, single cell sorting? No, not yet. We, we didn't do that also because uh, these um, uh, experiments are uh, really expensive and we wanted to have a definite answer. So uh, single cell will eventually give us uh, only very descriptive uh, data. But uh, this is something, of course, we, will, uh, we may consider uh, either single sec or sorting the cardiomyocytes because this is a very highly proliferation and uh, tumor-like um, uh, lesions that we did see in the pigs were never uh, evident in the mouse. And uh, we saw a lot more proliferation in pigs compared to mouse, which is somehow uh, encouraging in a way of translating this uh, into humans. But it will be very interesting and perhaps easier to sort out uh, proliferating cardiomyocytes in used to proliferate by the microRNA in pigs compared to, compared to mice, because we never saw that massive clusters of uh, highly proliferating microRNAs in, in mice. And this is also something that uh, is an issue for discussion because of the um, conservation of microRNA through species, but possibly the effect uh, exerted by the conserved microRNAs is not the same in multiple species. So it's really tricky to translate what you observe in mice and to pigs and then be sure that this will happen in humans as well. Well, the last question for time constraints is uh, about delivery. Uh, either microRNAs or mimics uh, were have been delivered in the in the muscle in the car in the car in the myocardium in the imper in the infarct border zone. Yes, this is the approach we we decided to use, uh, thinking at the possible application in humans, uh, and thinking at the possibility of using the Noga system, where you can really enter with a catheter in inside the left ventricular wall and um, um, map the electrical activity of the heart 
to really discriminate the border and then have a needle to locally inject the microRNA where it is really needed because this microRNA, as we saw, are so potent that uh, I won't consider a systemic delivery. They are associated with the proliferation of other cell types. So the trick would be really to induce a proliferative response that is as local as possible. Thank you, Dr. Zakinia. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting discussion. Thank I you. will now hand over to Professor Marban for the presentation. Yes, thank you, uh, Giulio. Um, I'm going to talk about um, our work on exosomes, but the way we got there was through cell therapy. And our initial goal with cell therapy, looking back 15 years, was to repair the permanently injured heart. But as we've discovered uh, things that we didn't anticipate, uh, our updated goals have become much broader, and they are to use cells, exosomes, or defined factors as new therapeutic candidates for a broad variety of inflammatory and fibrotic diseases. So uh, I'm going to briefly take you on this journey uh, in which we went from a very focused uh, goal to a very broad one uh, because of uh, following the data. Initially, the mechanistic rationale uh, for cell therapy was canonical, that would be transplantation of a progenitor cell or a stem cell. In this case, uh, CDCs, and I'll explain what those are uh, momentarily, but uh, just posit that this could be a, a cell that would be uh, mul uh, multipotent or pluripotent. And uh, these, the idea would be that transplanting these cells into the myocardium, they would proliferate, differentiate, and you'd get new healthy tissue of donor origin. And in fact, Pluripotent uh, stem cells um, may work this way, but we found that for um, CDCs, which is an adult uh, cardiac progenitor cell type, that didn't happen. Instead, we only observed short-term engraftment. After three weeks, the cells uh, were vanishingly low, less, far less than 1% of the cells remained in the myocardium. Um, but during the time that they're there, they secreted factors and led to uh, new healthy tissue of host origin. Uh, and persistent benefits even after six months or more. So what might those secreted factors have been? Well, uh, one hint came in the fact that CDCs do a lot of things other than uh, to stimulate cell proliferation. They're anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory, and I've already told you that they're evanescent. So um, this leads to the first question, um, and uh, Adult cell therapy, uh, generalizing from what I just said, works as follows. Uh, transplanted cells and graft, uh, they differentiate and, and proliferate. They secrete paracrine factors, but eventually disappear in the new, or the new tissues of donor origin. And there's only one correct answer here. Um, Eduardo, is this multiple question, uh, has, has this multiple question a, a one single answer or? One single answer, yeah. One single answer. So now we will see in a moment uh, which is uh, which are the thoughts of the audience. Then we have the result. So the ten percent of people think that transplanted cell engraft. The twenty-one percent that transplanted cells. Twenty-four percent actually now. Transplanted cells proliferate and differentiate. The 63%, I would say the mass, vast majority, think that transplanted cells secrete paracrine factors but eventually disappear. And only the 5% think that this is new tissue of donor or origin. So, yeah, so the 63% uh, were right. The overwhelming evidence, not just for cardiosphere derived cells, but also for any other adult cell therapy that's been put to the test is that they don't meaningfully do number one or number two or number four. Instead, they secrete paracrine factors, but eventually disappear. So what would those paracrine factors uh, be? Um, well, first of all, let me just uh, recap what uh, these cardiosphere derived cells are. The recipe was first described um, by uh, Rachel Smith and others in, in circulation. 
uh, in 2007, uh, and uh, it involves first forming uh, cardiospheres, uh, which uh, was a, a method that had been uh, previously described by Elisa Messina and colleagues in Rome. But then we took the additional step of plating the cardiospheres on monolayer culture to derive the CDCs. And after several passages, uh, they retain um, disease-modifying bioactivity. The methods and bioactivity of these cells has now been reproduced by 45 or more independent labs worldwide. Uh, and what are these cells? Um, they're, they qualify as human heart progenitor cells in the sense that they, um, in vitro and in a limited extent in vivo, can um, differentiate into multiple cell types. Uh, but they don't seem to do that with alacrity, and nor does that seem to be linked uh, specifically to their mechanism. And here, I have to acknowledge that the whole field of human heart progenitor cells has been somewhat discredited by uh, scientific scandals. But in this case, there's no uh, C-kit and no antigenic panning, which is the cell type that's been discredited uh, recently in terms of um, uh, falsification of data. Uh, this particular cell type that I'm uh, discussing, CDCs, hasn't been questioned at all. Um, these are cells that are from the adult uh, human heart or can also be a, a derived from any adult mammalian heart. They're uniformly positive for uh, CD105 uh, and negative for markers um, such as CD45 of hematogenous origin. They secrete a number of cytokines, including SDF1, but also exosomes. Uh, clinical trials now involving um, the uh, involving CDCs number 10, uh, seven have emerged from uh, directly from uh, our work, uh, and uh, another three uh, performed uh, independently by Hidemasa O and colleagues uh, in Japan. Uh, and uh, basically, um, uh, to summarize, um, there seems to be uh, at least um, in the totality. Uh, evidence of some disease-modifying bioactivity when these cells are uh, administered. Right now, the focus in clinical development for CDCs uh, has to do with Duchenne cardiomyopathy uh, and um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which I'll allude to uh, later in the talk. But what do we know about the mechanism of action? Well, first of all, the, there are paracrine effects. Those paracrine effects are mediated by exosomes, and I'll show you momentarily why we think that's the case. And what do these exosomes do? They promote cardiomyogenesis. Uh, they prevent uh, cardiomyositis apoptosis. They're anti-fibrotic and anti-inflammatory. So uh, what are exosomes? Um, you can see uh, here uh, that uh, they're uh, formed by invaginations of the surface membrane and fusion with the products of the Golgi to create multivesicular bodies, and multivesicular bodies by mechanisms that are as yet incompletely understood are either processed for degradation in the lysosomes or processed for exporting. Um, and as the multivesicular bodies that are um, exported fuse with the uh, plasma lemma, the exosomes uh, within those multivesicular bodies are secreted. These are uh, lipid bilayer uh, vesicles that are 30 to 150 nanometers roughly in size. Um, to put this in context, an HIV-1 virion has a diameter of 100 nanometers. So these are tiny uh, particles. They're present in all body fluids. And uh, by present, uh, I mean um, present richly, 10 to the 12th to 10 to the 13th um, extracellular vesicles per milliliter of, uh, uh, of blood or serum or ascites fluid or breast milk. Uh, they're released by nearly all cell types, uh, certainly by all eukaryotic cell types that have been uh, tested to date. And exosomes are loaded with microRNAs and with other uh, bioactive contents. Um, and uh, the thought is that they um, uh, deliver those contents to cells uh, which take them up and um, that uh, in so doing, they modify uh, the recipient cell behavior. Uh, the payloads of um, each exosome class are very cell specific and they're also very sensitive to the way the cells are grown. Uh, so that, for example, a, um, a set of exosomes um, 
secreted by a fibroblast uh, may not have uh, disease-modifying bioactivity, but by a CDC um, or other stem cells, uh, they might. So um, what is the reason that we are now zeroing in on exosomes as mediators of CDC benefit? Well, if you look at the, the lower left panel here, uh, what is shown is the trajectory over time of left ventricular ejection fraction in a mouse model. And this mouse at day zero had a left coronary ligation. Uh, and uh, if you just um, do nothing to the mouse, you can see that uh, vehicle over here in this panel, uh, it, nothing, there's no improvement over time, over one month in the left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, and that's exactly what happens if you transplant uh, CDCs and use uh, GW4869, which is a small molecule inhibitor of ceramide uh, synthesis, which is an exosome secretion inhibitor. So if you block exosome secretion or biogenesis, there's no benefit of CDCs, but CDCs that are not treated with a small molecule, uh, in fact, actually improve function over time. Uh, so blocking exosome biosynthesis gets rid of the benefits of CDCs. What about the converse? Can you mimic the effects of CDCs just using exosomes? So that's what's shown in the right-hand panel. If you give uh, exosomes from CDCs, the green line, you do get an improvement over time uh, in uh, ejection fraction that looks very similar to that of CDCs. If you do only vehicle, there's no improvement. And if you use exosomes from fibroblasts, uh, from skin fibroblasts, they don't have any benefit either. So it's not just a question of putting in any kind of exosome. It has to be the right kind of exosome to get this kind of benefit. And this work was uh, reported by uh, Ahmed Ibrahim uh, from my lab in 2014. So um, let's reflect now after having been aware that this mechanism is operative for the last five years, what we know now. Well, we now in the totality know that the exosome payloads mimic the CDC effects on multiple biological processes. They're regenerative, like the parent cells, antifibrotic, antiapoptotic, androgenic, anti-inflammatory, and uh, immunomodulatory. So uh, it leads to our next uh, multiple choice question. Again, there's one, there's one answer. Um, and exosomes are uh, lipid bilayer vesicles. Uh, they're the size of viruses. They're rich in RNA. They're all of the above, or they're none of the above. Professor Marban. Yes. So you say that exosomes are loaded with microRNAs. And do we know how many microRNAs can be loaded in one single exosome? That's a, an interesting quantitative uh, question. Uh, and in fact, um, only 7% of the RNA content of a typical exosome population, for example, uh, CDCs, consists of microRNAs. The focus has been on microRNAs mostly because we know what they do. But um, I think a lot of the action in the exosomes has to do with other populations um, than microRNAs. Um, although, to answer your question more directly, it's been calculated that at most there might be a single uh, microRNA molecule in the average exosome, or or maybe maybe one to ten per particle. So it, it becomes a quantitatively difficult um, uh, argument to say that only microRNAs are the bioactivity basis. Okay, so we have the results of your multiple choice question now. So 7% of uh, the attendees uh, believe that, 8% actually now, believe that uh, are lipidic bilayer vesicles, 1% that have the size of viruses, 7% that are rich in RNA, 79% all of the above, and only 5% known of the above. So 79% of the audience uh, had their coffee and um, chose the right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, once you um, understand that uh, these cell-free uh, particles uh, are loaded with microRNAs and, and basically don't replicate, they're just basically delivery vehicles, you can wonder if they have effects outside the heart. And in fact, we find that they have quite impressive um, and uh, pleiotrophic effects in, um, in a number of situations. 
in uh, dermal fibroblasts, for example, they convert uh, the phenotype and the secretome to become more like a therapeutic cell after they've been exposed or conditioned by human CDC exosomes. In a model of stroke in a rabbit with clot embolization, um, there's uh, improvement in the behavioral score. Um, and this is probably reflecting the fact that exosomes can traverse the blood-brain barrier to some degree, unlike cells. In Hubex and culture, they promote tube formation as a sort of surrogate of angiogenesis. Uh, human CDC exosomes have profound effects on uh, macrophages, um, including um, inducing IL-10 expression in, um, in spleen macrophages. And interestingly, increasing the clearance of amyloid beta protein uh, when they're uh, used to condition bone marrow macrophages. In a model of uh, myocardial infarction, um, we found that CDC exosomes are beneficial and we believe that that's due to a distinctive polarization of the uh, macrophages within the heart um, that enhance their uh, phagocytosis. Uh, this can be mimicked in the bone marrow or in cardiac uh, uh, resonant macrophages. Uh, in work by uh, Lillian Gregorian, when she was uh, in my laboratory, uh, uh, Lillian found that um, there were uh, improvements in aging uh, rats uh, in hair growth, uh, kidneys, and visceral uh, fat. Um, in rat skeletal muscle, exposure to CDC exosomes improves force and decreases fibrosis in MDX uh, mice. I'll show you that data momentarily. Human T cells, there's various uh, effects, including inhibition of degranulation and antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. And Lillian also reported while she was here that there's actually an inhibitory effect of CDC exosomes on um, fibrosarcoma growth. So, um, are exosomes just an alternative to cells, or are they a new, new entity with unique properties? I've already alluded to the fact that they, uh, for example, can traverse the blood-brain barrier, um, but which uh, cells cannot. But um, one thing that's important to know is just uh, recognition of the fact that CDCs uh, secrete exosomes and the exosomes are biologically active uh, rationalizes the benefits of, uh, of CDCs. They, they, one cell uh, secretes probably 10,000 exosomes in a day and therefore it amplifies the effects of cells and exosomes can travel long distances um, and therefore um, might rationalize uh, why, for example, injecting uh, CDCs into the heart might have long distance benefits on other uh, tissues like skeletal muscle. Um, there are also some emergent properties, things that we didn't necessarily anticipate. Um, they have extended shelf life. They can even be lyophilized. They penetrate cells and tissues not readily accessed by cells, such as uh, the blood brain barrier. And they can be readily manipulated after production using a variety of uh, covalent uh, modifications. Now, in a model of um, muscular dystrophy uh, caused by a, a spontaneous uh, mutation in exon 23 of the uh, dystrophin gene in mice, this is a, the well-known MDX mouse strain, um, we find um, that repeated injection of exosomes uh, has benefits. This is ejection fraction in a, this model of Duchenne cardiomyopathy. Uh, the baseline here is at 10 months of age when the, when the animals already have a somewhat depressed ejection fraction. The normal mouse ejection fraction is 75 to 80 percent. And you can see that it, the natural history of uh, uh, this disease is uh, progressive um, cardiac dysfunction over the next six months. Uh, this is in vehicle injected animals, but animals that were injected at 10 months with exosomes had a positive effect in terms of an increase in ejection fraction and a repeated injection uh, at 13 months had a, um, again, benefit. And what's notable here is that these are human exosomes in non-immunosuppressed mice. If you put in human cells into a non-immunosuppressed mouse, they're cleared very quickly but there seems to be a somewhat immunoprivilege uh, so that xenogeneic applications are uh, possible, at least with two injections. We don't know yet if uh, some kind of immune reaction or tolerance might develop uh, after uh, multiple uh, injections. Uh, and the exosomes uh, decrease the fibrotic content, the amount of collagen within the, uh, this is collagen one and collagen three uh, westerns. Uh, and uh, they also induce cardiomyogenesis in the tissue, as uh, seen here by KI67 or by Aurora B. 
So uh, the last multiple choice question um, asks you to choose one answer uh, in comparing exosomes to cells. Uh, the first possibility is that exosomes uh, self-replicate while cells don't self-replicate. Um, the second is that cells secrete exosomes. Uh, the third posits that exosomes cluster together in the body to create new cells. And the fourth uh, presumes that exosomes are fragile living entities. So, um, Professor Marban, what about the lipid content of the exosomes? Have you got any news about that? Yeah, the lipid content of exosomes is uh, less well studied than their um, RNA and protein contents, but they seem to have um, a quite distinctive uh, lipid content relative to, uh, for example, the plasma lemma. Um, predictively, they're richer in ceramide, and um, there's um, a distinctive profile that can be used to distinguish them from uh, simply um, budding off of the plasma lemma. So yeah, this is a, a distinguishing feature for sure. Thank you. So we have the, the result of the poll. The 6% of uh, people believe that exosome self-replicate cells don't. The 59% believe that cells secrete exosomes. 33% think that exosomes cluster together in the body to create new cells. And only 2% that exosomes are fragile living entities. So we have a majority that uh, believe that cells secrete exosomes. Well, that indeed is the right answer, but let me uh, reflect on, on the others. So exosomes, unlike viruses, exosomes are the size of a virus, but they don't self-replicate. And of course, cells uh, do uh, uh, tend to uh, divide, at least if they're not senescent. Uh, reflecting on number three, um, exosomes don't cluster together together in the body to create new cells. Sometimes they create clusters in the body, but they don't uh, create uh, any new cells. They don't have uh, organelles within them, for example. And uh, the final thing, uh, which only 2% uh, of the audience uh, voted on, um, they're not living uh, and they're not particularly fragile. And so um, that's, not, uh, that's not right. So finally, let me reflect on uh, whether well, not finally, but ultimately, whether excess therapeutic exosomes will reach the clinic. Well, I've already told you there's clinical grade uh, CDCs that are being manufactured. And then it's just a question of taking the media conditioned by CDCs without any kind of supplementation, such as FBS, so that you don't get any exogenous uh, xenogenic exosomes from the bovine serum, uh, and uh, also filtering um, the conditioned media and other processing steps to create. And what in, what in this case is being called CAP 2003, but basically it's an enriched extracellular vehicle uh, product, extracellular vesicle product. Uh, and um, so um, the final thing I want to reflect on uh, in any depth is the fact that exosomes can be used as a platform for defined uh, contents. And rather than dwell on this uh, extensively, I refer you to the uh, various uh, descriptions in the papers that are cited here for evidence that microRNA-146A might figure prominently in some manifestations of cardiomyogenesis. Uh, 181B uh, may explain some of the effects in macrophages. While this interesting yRNA fragment, which was novel fragment of uh, um, yRNA-4, uh, uh, actually uh, itself induces um, Im important changes in the phenotype of uh, macrophages and increases IL-10 and leads to cardiac protection. In a very recent paper, um, just came out a couple of weeks ago, we've uh, created designer uh, exosomes uh, from therapeutic uh, cells that have been immortalized and genetically engineered. These are immortalized CDCs that have been modified to uh, inhibit uh, uh, MEST, which is a suppressor of beta-catenin, or uh, activated specialized tissue effector exosomes that are made by fibroblasts that have been genetically modified uh, to uh, overexpress GATA4 and beta catena. And these uh, now are immortal uh, factories that transcend any reliance on primary tissue, and they're customizable and tunable for specific indications. And I refer you to this uh, paper for more explanation. 
So uh, to summarize the trajectory, you know, in 2004, we were believers in autologous therapy because we thought that uh, the um, uh, benefits uh, would be canonical. Instead, we realized that uh, the cell uh, cells can be transient and leading to an allogeneic paradigm. We then identified exosomes as mediators, leading to the concept of cell-free therapeutics. We're guessing that maybe sometime in the next year, this could be introduced into humans. It might be a little longer, but that's our, our present goal. Uh, we've mined exosome contents to identify defined factors and more recently produced immortal cell lines as a basis for next generation therapeutics. And uh, I talked to you uh, from sunny uh, Los Angeles, where it's uh, now uh, 10 o'clock in the morning almost. Thank you, Professor Marvin, for, for this very interesting presentation. I think we have a uh, little time to share the chat questions. Uh, I will uh, read this one. Uh, can we control the variability of exosomes? Can, can we control the variability of exosomes? Right. Well, um, we can by standardizing the uh, culture conditions and by um, producing as homogeneous a, a donor cell type as possible. So this is one way that we think these immortal lines might be very helpful because uh, the same line uh, that we create exosomes from in the same condition now could in principle be uh, used in 10 years to do the same thing from frozen aliquots. Another question is about does parental cell matter? For instance, which are the differences with mesenchymal cell exosomes? Oh, there's enormous differences based on the parental cell uh, of origin. And um, I'm not uh, in any way arguing that uh, CDC exosomes are uh, unique in being therapeutically active. In fact, exosomes from pluripotent stem cells have been found to be, uh, to have disease modifying bioactivity in different, um, in different settings. What I can tell you is that if you look at the RNA and protein uh, fingerprints of exosomes derived from mesenchymal stem cells versus CDCs, for example, they're quite different, uh, both in their traditional contents of microRNAs, and, but even more importantly in some of the unknown RNAs that we have yet to mine. Thank you. Um, I think we have unfortunately to stop here. We are now approaching the end of this webinar. And I would like to close this session by summarizing the key messages for your daily practice. First is that macadamicide proliferation is a target of regenerative therapies. Although the control of molecular case needs adjunctive lab work. Exosomes are promising cell-free cardiovascular therapeutics. However, the proof of concept needs to be tested, still tested in humans. And lastly, uh, the, the translational path to cardiac regeneration is still underway. However, the current evidence indicates that it can be feasible and for sure is an interesting, very interesting avenue for future research. I like to thank very much Dr. Zakinia and Professor Marban for, the, for their interesting presentations. You will be able to watch this webinar on demand on the EC website. And uh, finally, I like to remind you that uh, the CARE Working Group uh, has a, a website on the ESC website and to take a look at that. Thank you of uh, all the attendees for having follow us through the, during this webinar. And uh, I close this session. <laughs>